And I say, and anybody who's attended one of my seminars knows this to be, Jim knows it to be true. Uh, at the very beginning of it, uh, I say that, that all word of faith and NAR are charismatic, but not all charismatics are word of faith. Okay, I make that distinction all the time. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not calling in and of itself the, the continuous position heretical. I'm, I'm de I think it's a serious issue, but I don't call that in and of itself heretical. In fact, I even, you know, at times mention you and uh, John Piper and Wayne Grudem, and I say these are fully expect to see these brothers in Christ, uh, see these brothers in heaven, believe they are. Uh, but I, but that's not what I'm, I'm critiquing the word faith in a or prosperity stuff. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Well, you heard it here first, guys. The rest of us charismatics might not be heretics. That's a great way to start off this video. Some common ground saying, well, maybe maybe we're not all apostate. Uh, it's an encouraging word to get from Justin. Today, we're going to be diving into a roundtable discussion from the uh, American Gospel. Now, it is no longer a documentary. documentary. It's a docu-series, so you can, for a subscription price, uh, get access to all that is the American Gospel stuff. You can check out the American Gospel. Just Google them. You'll find their website. Uh, they've got some uh, stuff up there. I've, I was in this docu-series with my buddy, Matthew Tarpley. I haven't actually seen that footage yet, but I know that it's out there. Uh, we reviewed this four-hour piece of content. We are not going to do an exhaustive review of it today. Uh, we are kind of focusing on the last third of it, talking about, in particular, the gift of miracles and healing, uh, interactions between Sam Storms, Dr. Michael Brown, uh, Justin Peters, and Jim Osman. Uh, I will let you know on the front end, we're going to be dealing mostly with the cessationist clips and some of their claims in that video, since we kind of already agree with Sam Storms and Michael Brown. It would be redundant to say, yeah, we agree with that. Uh, so that's kind of what you have to look forward to and expect in this video. But I also want to let you know uh, that Remnant Radio, uh, if you want to stay contact con connected, whoa, words are hard today. Let's not speak in tongues for the cessationist. Uh, uh, the uh, <laughs> the video, if you, if you want to, if you want to be, uh, oh my gosh, I'm having a stroke. I must, my brain's not working. If you want to stay connected with all the things that we're doing here on Remnant Radio, there's a link in the description. Uh, you can uh, check out the newsletter there. It talks about conferences, courses, videos that we have coming out, all that good stuff. I'm going to quick punt it over to my buddies, my partners in crime, because my brain's not working. Uh, hey, dude. Maybe one of you guys was... have better use of words today than I do. <laughs> that was a little rough, bro. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what I was doing. About the episode. I just... uh, I, yeah, I just watched yesterday the full four hours, although we're going to be talking about like the last hour of it uh, on the American Gospel docuseries where they uh, where they show this little round table quasi debate conversation. So uh, anyway, excited about this episode. And yes, the Justin Peters calls us not heretics. That's awesome. In fact, he, he even called at least Grudem, uh, Piper and Storm's brothers. And what I love about that video. What's that? Is he does not address Michael Brown, who's sitting in the room. He just says, you, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> then he says, yeah, dude, dude. Then he, then he names other guys dude. that aren't there. He totally ignores Brown. I think well, it's hilarious. What if it was like an intentional own? Like, like Brown, I don't think you're getting in, bro. <laughs> I have no clue what it was. I'd, I, I'd I like to know. Wasn't. I'd like to know where Chris Roseborough and Justin Peters disagree then. Because Chris Roseborough calls everybody who signed that statement heretical. Uh, and he would throw Sam in that category and John Piper and others. Uh, so I'm, I'm just kind of curious. It seems like Justin and Chris Roseborough have a disagreement about those things. Is that, am I off on well, this? I, I mean, I'll tell you, everyone who signed the prophetic standard statement believes in a false God and a false gospel <laughs> and they're false prophets. That is, that is the, the quote from Chris three. Roseborough. I was the only one of us three that signed it because y'all were like nitpicky about one word. And I was like, yeah, it's not the no, best word, but whatever. I was like too afraid of being labeled a false prophet by Chris Roseboro. So you I just, wanted, I personally. You were trying to get into I was, heaven. I was seeking the approval of men and God. So that's why I didn't well, sign it personally. Guys, I have an important update. 
Super important. I don't know if you guys know this. Oh, look, I, look I right think here. I see the update. It's a base, look at base that. boy look at that. LED sign. Those of you who are, are listening on the no, audio, uh, Michael got a basement boy sign. Neon him. sign. Neon yeah, sign. I got to paint the picture. That's pretty great. Yeah, it's pretty it's great. great, dude. I got to give you give you props on that. Well, we should probably jump into the episode, though, because we're just like, I don't know. We're Woody just banter chumming at it five up. minutes. Yeah. yeah, good call. Let's let's dive into the first clips. These are uh, quick clips as the, as we do, you know, uh, short clips. I'll walk in through it. Like I said, we engage mostly with the cessationist uh, uh, Brandon Kimber, a guy who's been super kind and friendly to us over here at Remnant. We've engaged back and forth. Um, I've I've uh, sent him our stuff for uh, Todd White when we interviewed Todd. I kind of wanted to give it to a bunch of the YouTube discernment channels. I just wanted to give it to him in advance and just say, hey. Uh, I know that there's kind of a desire to respond to these things quickly, and I want everyone to be super careful with the way that they respond. So think through this, think carefully. I'm going to release it on this date. If you would kind of hold your critique videos until maybe the day after, that'd be great. Um, anyway, so he was, you know, he's he's always played nice. I think he's he's been fair at representing both sides. Uh, I've always appreciated Brandon. So uh, he, he did mention to me in an email, which I didn't respond to because I got busy, uh, that uh, there were a few uh, audio uh, kind of glitches almost in the live or in the video that he had uploaded to uh, the American Gospel page, like on their on their website. But what was going out to YouTube just in a few days on Friday, I think it's going to be uh, published, you know, uh, has got some more uh, audio edits to it uh, that kind of improve the audio across the board. But the clips that I've used, I didn't think there was any kind of audio abnormality since we were kind of dealing uh, primarily with the cessationists with Jim uh, and with Justin. So I felt like this was good content. Uh, his, you know, uh, if you guys want to watch this all together, it'll be out on the YouTubes here pretty soon from what I understand. Let's watch this first clip from our buddy, Justin. Uh, I don't believe that it is always God's will to be healed. I would differ with you in that because I see too many examples, Old and New Testament, of faithful servants of God who were sick and, as best we know, were never healed. Um, Exodus 4, God speaking to Moses, who has made man's mouth, who makes him dumb or deaf or seeing or blind. Mm -hmm. Is it not I, the Lord? Um, Elisha, great prophet, right? Double portion anointing. Second Kings 13, verse 14 died of an illness. Mm -hmm. He died of sickness. Um, Paul, and I don't even go to a thorn in the flesh. I go to Galatians 4, 13, 14. He said, but you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I came and preached the gospel to you the first time. Sam, you mentioned Trophimus, that Paul left sick in Miletus. He didn't heal him. He left him sick. Um, um, Timothy, Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach and your frequent ailments. Uh, and Job, I mean, excuse me, not Job. Well, you can look at Job. But um, David in Psalm 119, 71, he said, it was good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn your statutes. Now, exactly what that affliction was. You know, we could talk about that. But you see all of these examples, and there's many more we could cite of faithful servants of God who were sick. And as far as we know, were not healed. And so I am very comfortable in telling people, based upon the, the record of Scripture, that sometimes when it pleases God to do it, he does heal people. And I've seen a few examples that are very compelling to me that I have no problem with. But uh, I will not and cannot, because I'm not convinced from Scripture, I'm convinced otherwise from Scripture, that it is always God's will to be healed, because that places the burden upon the one who is sick. There you go. That's a, a serious concern. I think we probably want to start off saying we generally agree that uh, if you place a burden on someone who's already sick, sick, you're adding insult to injury uh, by saying, look, uh, you've already got this sickness. Well, I just want to let you know God would heal you, except you don't have enough faith and you've got secret sin in your life. God always wants to heal you. This is your problem. Uh, if that is the way that that is being packaged, we would call that spiritual abuse. That is not good. Uh, we would. We've stated we would, that publicly. Yeah, holy, like every time we do a video on healing, we go out of our way to say it's not because you have a demon. It's not necessarily because uh, you, you know you've got sin in your life. It's not necessarily because you don't, you have a lack of faith. We go out of our way to build those qual qualifiers and spiritual airbags. Uh, anyway, so uh, I'll toss it over to you guys. What do y'all What do y'all think about that that clip? Yeah, I'll start with Miller. Yeah, I mean, I don't. There's not much about that I agree or disagree with. I'm going. Yeah, I agree completely that not everybody who uh, uh, who claims to have a gift of healing uh, sees everyone healed, or do they believe that it's always God's will to heal? Uh, I know that he'll he'll statistically state that it's like that's the vast majority of all charismatics. They believe it's always God's will to heal. And what's frustrating about that is there is some big name brands out there that would preach that. Uh, Bethel would say that it's always God's will to heal, that God can't give away what he doesn't have. That's a direct Bill Johnson quote oh. when it comes to uh, sickness. Although even Bill seems to have backed off of that, but go ahead. After yeah, the he death, does, well, after the death of his wife, he said, God is not a vending machine. So it, 
seems like he backed off of it a little bit, but you'd have to really uh, – his earlier well, quotes before that, yeah, not good. I, I think he speaks out of both sides of his mouth here, Michael. I agree. I think on one side he would say it's Might always God's will to heal, and then when somebody is sick, he'll say – he'll leave it in the realm of mystery uh, of why they're not healed in that place. So while he would never blame people for a lack of faith or blame people that it's automatically got to be their sin uh, or a demon um, – he, he does leave a little room of mystery there. It's just where he puts the mystery. Uh, yeah, well, and, and that's, and that's an incredibly... Say, hold on, let me finish my thought. The other thing that I would mention here is when um, Justin Peters said, he leaves it in the place of the only conclusion you could draw is that they have a lack of faith, right? That's the, that's the logical conclusion is that they have a lack of faith. And he says that's the majority position of all charismatics, um, or at least those who are in the limelight. I go... I actually don't hear that from Bethel. I don't hear them blaming people for a lack of faith when people aren't healed. He's just saying that that's the logical conclusion. But yet when you hear from Bill's own mouth, he would never go there. Yeah. Is that well, right? I, I think it depends on how you parse it because Bill has made some statements and in the, uh, inter and in the round table, Justin quotes one of them, which I've seen before too, uh, where Bill says something like the problem, uh, you know, if somebody doesn't get healed, you know, the promises are awesome and this is awesome and God's awesome. So the problem's not on God's end it, and implicitly it's on ours. So I have heard him teach that before, but I don't think that interpersonally in any prayer situation, Bill would ever be like, well, it's actually just your fault. I don't think he would ever say that. However, as a teacher of the word of God, we are responsible for what we say. And if we say things that imply the guilt of another, I, I think that's bad. And so I think it's actually right to point that out, that that's bad. And I, I would be curious to talk to Bill and say, do you still hold that position? Or did, you know, have you shifted later in life, which seems like might have happened? Uh, Josh, what about you? Um, well, I would say personally on, this. on the side of on the side of Bethel, I mean, if I'm going to weigh in on that, um, I do think that they speak outside of both sides of their mouth. And again, I think that has to do with the lack of theological categories and not recognizing that they're doing it. I think it's out of ignorance, um, which some people would interpret me saying it's out of ignorance. That must mean that it's okay. They don't mean to. I'm actually saying, no, it's ignorance as in like you shouldn't follow people who don't have um, uh articulable theological positions, even as inarticulate as I am today in this program, um, I would say that, yeah, you you should follow people who are careful, have theological categories that are careful. Um, we are commanded to teach doctrine and not to teach faulty doctrine and aberrant doctrine. And the, you know, the doctrines of Christ liberate, they free their truth. Um, and I, I don't think that any kind of, man, preaching and teaching of the gospel um, that adds insult to injury, whether it's intentional or unintentional. Man, I just see that kind of thing happening in Bethel so frequently. They're constantly coming out with statements saying, oh, you know, we didn't mean that. Uh, oh, we said this, but we actually meant that. Like, I mean, we've got tarot cards, blue genies. We've got grave soaking. We've got, you know, physics of heaven. Um, there's so many different situations. This would be another one, right? Like, there's so many uh, constant errors being cranked out of that space. I'll say what I've always said. I don't think it's a safe space. I don't, I don't trust Bethel. I wouldn't encourage people to go to Bethel. I don't think it's safe. That being said, I do believe that the people that are present and we'll kind of do this in a, maybe a part two where we kind of review the other sections of, uh, this long round table where we talk about false teachers, what constitutes a false teacher and a false prophet, those kinds of things. Um, uh, I don't. I can't categorize them as false teachers, false prophets. I think that they're genuine brothers and believers that have lousy theological categories, um, and, and that gets them that into we a lot strongly of trouble. disagree with. Yeah, yeah, we, we yeah. strongly yeah. disagree. But with. I, I think we'll see Bill Johnson in heaven and Justin Peters, and I really look forward to like I don't know, maybe maybe like resurrected flag football on the new earth with with Bill Johnson and Justin Peters. I think it's going to be a blast because we're all going to like laugh and have a good time. Uh, I'm there'll be no need for the flags, but, but in all honesty, uh, some brotherly fellowship with folks who really disagree. Uh, I consider all of you brothers. Um, here's one more thing though that I want to point out on the clip because cessationists commonly claim, and maybe you guys can help me remember. It was a long interview whether they made this claim or not. Cessationists commonly claim that the gift of healing is on demand, that that's the definition of the gift of healing. And Justin goes through a laundry list of people who weren't healed, including people who weren't healed 
by the Apostle Paul. And so who, this seems who we, to... Who would agree had a gift of healing. Yeah, who, yeah, who I think we would have to agree had a gift of healing, considering that Paul's hanky healed some people. Um, this, this dude had an incredible healing, anointing, or empowerment upon his life. And so what we would say as continuationists is like, yes and amen to all of those examples and those people really got sick and God didn't heal some of them and sometimes used a medical means like the, you know, Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach's sake, et cetera. And, uh, and what we would say is the gift of healing was never on demand. That's not actually what it means. So, um, and, and then I think the other thing that I would say is when we talk about like, God's will for healing, we, we're going to have to talk about the two wills of God, but I'm going to be patient and not do that yet. So, so that's my last thought on it. So should we Okay, talk I'll, about... I'll weigh in here. Okay, so uh, yes, oh, they do say uh, that the uh, gift of healing is on command. Jim Osmond says it, and Sam is going to respond to it in a clip that we have. It's clip three. Uh, but I think what's interesting is I think he creates kind of like a, this non sequitur of um, well, because these good people in the Old Testament and, you know, we could push that term of good people, obedient people in the Old Testament. He mentions a bunch of people who, frankly, weren't good. Um, David has got his own moral flaws, uh, along with many of the others that he mentions. Uh, good is a relative term, but I think we're going to go ahead and concede the ground that these people are in covenant relationship with God. And that's what he meant, deemed righteous by faith, that kind of thing. Uh, and they're kind of walking with the Lord and there's some kind of sickness, disease, things like that that are involved in their life. I, I think, though, they're kind of ignoring the use of means uh, when we're talking about uh, healing uh, in particular. So like in First in Kings 18, Elijah prayed for rain for six months or six, six times with no avail. Uh, should he have assumed it was not God's will to send rain? after praying for six times. It wasn't until the seventh time that God ended up sending rain, right? Uh, in Mark 5, the woman with the issue of blood spent all of her money on physicians. And if it was God's will to heal her, like wouldn't those physicians have, you know, actually healed her? Uh, or in Mark 9, 18 through 29, the disciples uh, ca are trying to cast out a demon out of a boy who's throwing himself in the fire and in the water. Um, now they could have decided, well, we can't cast this demon out. It must not be God's will to cast this demon out. Uh, but in all of these occasions, it was actually persistent prayer. Now, that caused uh, uh, a kind of inbreaking, if you will, of an answer to prayer with the rain. Uh, it was Jesus who comes off of the mountain that delivers the little boy from the demons. Uh, and it's this woman's faith that she reaches out and touches Jesus that causes uh, her healing. So as much as we can say, uh, well, because we saw these people sick, therefore it must not be God's will. Well, what would have happened if Elijah stopped praying? Could we have said, well, it must not have been God's will to send rain? What would have happened if Jesus didn't come off the mountain and, and they, he maybe went down another way and the disciples met up with him and said, hey, there's this crazy story where this guy, you know, we couldn't cast the demons out of him. Could we have said it wasn't God's will to deliver? Just because something doesn't happen or does happen, I think they're kind of assuming uh, the outcome of that will where, where God uses means to accomplish his will. So uh, I think that this is kind of an oversimplification of just quoting people in the Old Testament that we're sick, therefore it's it's God's plan uh, for us to be sick, where the New Testament tells us things that are clearly God's will uh, that don't come to pass all the time. So like 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6. Michael, you have this in your Bible, don't you? It's in it's in the ESV, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, Michael's yeah heard I this have 1 Timothy 2 in my Bible. 1 Timothy, four, uh, 1 Timothy uh, 2, uh, verses 4 through 6, talks about how God wills all people to come to a knowledge of the truth. I think Michael says most people who he he desires to come to the knowledge of the truth oh, uh, the Cal calvinist about my calvinism over there i'm just messing i'm just messing around i'm just messing around hey, at all least love, i have a theological home but we won't I'm, go there i'm all in love so it says that he he was i'd rather be people. homeless and right <laughs> <laughs> ah, homeless and right then housed housed in the den of sinners now i'm just kidding pick a horse uh, and ride it bro I'm just messing around. Okay, everyone's got their verses. But in 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6, it says that God wills all people to come to a knowledge of the truth. He wants all men to be saved. Well, why is it that they're not all saved? It's because it seems as if we have these two wills of God. We see this in Arminian systems. We see this in Calvinist systems. We're just parsing those lines in different places. God has this kind of internal desire, heart, will, passion. And when people are saying it's God's will to heal the sick, we're saying it in that latter sense, in the sense that he wills all to be saved. It's the desire of God in creation. He creates Eden 
sinless, sickless, diseaseless. Uh, we get to the age to come, sinless, sickless, diseaseless. He wants all people to be saved. He created them saved. He ends with it saved. Does that make sense? So there's this desired outcome, this heart of God that we can see in the Old Testament. Um, Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord your God. I'm your healer, right? Uh, Matthew uh, 4, 23 through 24, he heals them all, cast out all their demons, all their paralyzed, they all get healed. Uh, Matthew 9, 35, he went to all the towns healing every disease and sickness. Matthew 12, 15, and healed all who were ill. Luke 6, 19, uh, because power was coming from him and healed them all over and over and over. We see, what it, th whether it be through creation, the, the beginning, eschatology, the end, uh, Jesus manifesting the very heart, nature, and character of the Father, healing everyone, and even God's very name being your healer, I think you can say definitively, just with an overarching look of Scripture, it is God's will to heal. That does not mean it's going to happen in this life. It's just to say that he has this kind of desire for the way that creation would be exercised and that well, we think, are wanting that same thing. I think it, it bothers me, his, his willingness to say it's not always God's will to heal and then cites those examples, but then he makes that the prototype for all for how the gift of healing ought to be, right? If it's a gift of healing, it's on command. And yet he also says that it's not always God's will to heal, which we agree with. But then to give those examples, uh, he then takes those examples as his default position in all things. And I think what concerns me is his default position today would be untenable if he was around the apostles and Jesus. And yet that was a position of many, uh, that God is not doing those things today. Um, yeah. And I just... I can't help but wonder, would he end up dismissing the Lord himself and the apostles if he brought that kind of skepticism into a conversation with them in that day? Um, that is a default position, is not necessarily the scriptural position when it comes to God's will to heal. What? Hmm. What's well, interesting, I'll oh, go ahead, M M Michael, I just monologue oh, for a while. I was going to say, I thought we were going to save our two wills of God conversation, but now I'm fired up for, uh, we'll just uh, do it yeah. now especially since we we brought up my Calvinism. So, uh, of course, it's not just Calvinism. <laughs> it was that determined up, that we would do it now, of God as a Calvinist, we'll talk about God's sovereign will versus his moral will, his efficient versus his permissive will, secret versus revealed will, uh, decretive versus perceptive will. Go check out our two wills of God on healing conversation. It's really an important conversation. You see, for instance, in the scripture that God's will is he predestined the cross, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, um, so, so yes, it was God's will that Christ be crucified. And yet Exodus 20, 10 commandments, nobody, you know, you're not supposed to kill anybody. And so like God's moral will is he never wants anyone to get killed. And yet he willed the death of Jesus. And so you see it there. Josh applied it in the area of salvation with first Timothy chapter two. And, uh, and so, and so we talk about the two wills of God. And I, and I think that it's important to speak with that nuance because, uh, in, in some sense, it is always God's will to be healed because one day we're all going, all believers are going to be healed in the resurrection. And, uh, and, and we see God reveal his will throughout scripture and Josh named a whole bunch of passages. So like, uh, to, to borrow Dane Ortland's phrase, it's God's deepest heart. He loves healing just like he loves salvation. Uh, and yet at the same time in his sovereign will, it doesn't fit within that plan for everybody to on demand be healing every single healed every single time. And so I actually like that Justin brought up mystery. And, uh, and I think that's an important part of this, but, but if somebody asks me, is it God's will to heal? There's a yes and no, like it's always God's will to heal. It's always what he wants, what he loves the most. Uh, is it always what he predetermined planned? In this life right now? No. So which sense are you talking about it? Because the Bible will use the word will in both senses. And for me personally, when I'm praying for healing, I think it's really important to come with the understanding that God's heart, his deepest heart, what he really, 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 really wants to see is healing. And so I think we're speaking past each other a little bit when we say it either is or it isn't so definitively. That's right. Well, and I want to kind of reiterate earlier, I was talking about you know, the experience, 
because he is saying that there was experience of Old Testament saints who weren't healed that were in right standing with God. And I was saying that there are experiences of Old Testament saints who didn't receive healing. I mentioned the woman with the issue of blood. I mentioned the boy who cast himself in the, the, the water and the fire and Elijah, all living under the Old Covenant. I know some of them are in the New Testament, but they live in the Old Covenant, right? Um, and and these in this, in this picture weren't seeing... Uh, something. They didn't assume it wasn't God's will though, right? They kept pursuing. And that's, I think that's what's really important is we should not determine what is God's will uh, based off of experience. Uh, We should do it off of the explicit text of scripture. Now, granted, Justin is basing it off of the experience of those in scripture. I think that's fine. Uh, But again, I think that these other illustrations of people who didn't see breakthrough, that we should actually follow their model just because you aren't seeing it. You know, I've got a got a dad with coculars, right? He's got two cochlear, no, no actual hearing ears, right? Uh, so he's got these two little magnets that stick on the side of his head and, you know, they've got speakers on them and that's how he hears. He's, he's, he's robo dad, right? Uh, and, and I pray for my dad to be healed and I will pray for him. I hope until he gets home, right? And, and do I want my dad to be healed in this life? Absolutely. And if he doesn't get healed in this life, he will receive the perfect will of God in the age to come. In the same way that I believe it's God's will that we should live holy and blameless and set apart and not in any kind of a shifting shadow of sin within our heart, I really believe that's God's will for us in this life. I don't think any of us are going to see it perfectly in this life. So I can see that that's God's will. And I have not yet obtained the mark of the high calling, but I'm going to keep pressing on to that mark. Uh, And I think the same can be said of healing. Even if we don't get it in this life, we should still press on to that mark. We should still seek what I do believe is God's will, which is healing. Uh, And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'll I'll add one more scripture to this. Jesus in Nazareth, right? says he could not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. And the unbelief that we're talking about, and it tells us in the text, they just thought he was the carpenter's son. You know, the brothers are like, you know, they didn't believe in him. Um, well, the the implication in that text is that God and Jesus was willing to do more healing in that place. But those people weren't going to come to him for prayer. And so we do see in an instance where God is willing something when it comes to healing. That was a default. And yet it didn't happen because these people rejected him to the point where they had unbelief. Right? They just refused to acknowledge him as Messiah and God. And so I I think that also plays into the conversation here. Um, If one was to look at Jesus's experience in Nazareth, then they could walk away, say, you know, go and say, look, it's not always God's will to heal without even looking at the context there. And and I just go, here we have examples again of what God wants to do. And yet there is a space for people to deny what God wants to do and go the opposite direction with it. And the Lord allows that to happen. And so I, I think here again, two wills of God, right? You've got this sovereign desire. He is willing to do something, and yet mankind plays a part in that. And yet the the, the overall picture is what is, if you're a Calvinist, for instance, you'd say that was predestined, that God didn't heal in Nazareth in that way. Um, Don't you think that works, guys? I think so. Totally. Yeah. Roundtree, you got anything else you want to add to this? Next clip? Uh, You know, what's funny is someone in the chat asked, are y'all really able to keep up with the chat and with the live chat and the show? And I'm like, no. usually not. And then I literally lost y'all's conversation because I was talking to him. So, <laughs> That's what which happens. Which means it's time for the next clip. That's okay, right. we're going to be talking That's about right. praying for the sick. <laughs> Justin talks about how he prays for the sick. In this next clip, let's uh, let's learn. I, I, pray, I pray that the Lord's will would be done. I have people that I pray for who are sick. And I, I pray, Lord, if it would be your will, heal that person, um, but your will be done. I pray that all the time. I pray that, that God's grace would be sufficient. But, I mean, I understand that you two men would not say to someone who is sick, well, you're not healed because the reason you haven't been healed is because of your lack of faith. I understand you wouldn't say that, but that's not the message that's going out in the vast majority with the vast majority of prominent charismatic preachers okay here we go a couple things uh to start off with on this one uh your will be done prayers roundtree i've heard you talk about this recently you came out in my church and spoke about uh praying for the sick healing those kinds of things uh you want to weigh in on that yeah well uh i don't love 
I mean, it's not like God's going to penalize you for saying that. It's good to submit your heart to the will of God and say whatever you want. But uh, I mean, to submit your heart to God rather than just saying willy nilly things. Uh, but I think we have enough revelation, like specifically when it comes to healing, enough revelation about God's heart for healing. Jesus is the word of God. My words express my heart. Will Jesus perfectly express the Father's heart? John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What does Jesus do? On many occasions, he heals them all. The Father's heart is to heal. So we have enough revelation of the Father's heart. I don't feel like I need to go into each individual case every single time saying, if it be your will, if it be your will, and kind of hedge it with, if your grace is, uh, let your grace be sufficient, uh, which is a 2 Corinthians 12 reference to Paul and the thorn in his flesh, where he doesn't get his answer to prayer. Uh, I think think for me, I would rather just, when it comes to healing, I'm just making this as a general rule of thumb, as a boots on the ground reality, how I approach it, I tend to not pray if it be your will. There could be a one-off scenario where I do, or where I am asking the Lord, like for instance, if I'm going to somebody on their deathbed, uh, sometimes the right thing is for them to pass away and to go and be with the Lord. So I'm not like necessarily praying, Lord, raise them up if that's... Uh, so. There can be a time and a place for it, but as a general rule, I'm going in believing that uh, that it is God's uh, God's will, if we use the sense in His deepest heart, to heal somebody. And the other thing is that I would say, as it regards the "if it be Your will," it it is the Garden of Gethsemane prayer, Matthew 26, and the other Gospels too. Uh, and, and what we have to understand there is that Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity, one with the Father for eternity past in the Spirit too, of course. And so he knows this predestined, predetermined plan that he's going to go to the cross. And it helps you appreciate the boldness of his prayer. That Jesus is saying, hey, if it be your will, I'd rather not do this thing that we planned billions of years ago. <laughs> like, like that's a massive prayer. This should give us huge permission to pray the impossible. I mean, what does that prayer even mean for the second person of the Trinity to go before his father and like, like you knew the predestined plan. How can you, how can you pray for something different? Well, you tack on if it be your will, because it's such a crazy prayer. And I think what it's meant to do is embolden our prayer life to ask for the impossible rather than hedging our bets so that we're basically praying. I kind of don't, and I'm not putting this on Justin, but when people pray this, oftentimes, if it be your will means it's probably not. So I'll just rest in whatever. And, and certainly rest in whatever. We believe in mystery. We believe in the redemptive value of suffering. But if I'm going to look at the prayer of the Garden of Gethsemane, I'm not going to take from it sort of a fatalistic resignation, not putting that on Justin. Rather, I'm going to put on it a massive boldness to pray impossible things before God. I. I think there's also the the precedent there. So something else that just I think would be helpful in the conversation. We talk about charismatics usually believe that it is that their default is that it's God's will to heal in a general sense. I think that's fair to do because again, his name is Jehovah Rapha. You also think of like, you know, Exodus 34, 6, when it says the Lord passed before uh, Moses and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, God, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Well, he, he attaches this characteristic about God to his name. Well, all the more reason for why when God calls himself the Lord, your healer, Jehovah Rapha, we should also default to believing that's in his character to do so. And so I want to default and believe the things that are attached to his character and his nature. And so then you take it over to the prayer of if it be your will. Okay, so Justin has as a default to pray if it be your will, which is an interesting thing because it's one prayer in the entirety of Scripture, just one. And yet when it comes to healing, you don't see that prayer once applied if it be your will. Nowhere, not a single example when it comes to healing. And yet we have a characteristic of God, part of his attribute is to heal. And so why pray and if it be your will, rather than the vast majority of scriptures that seem to show that it is his will? Like it seems to be an overemphasis on one text, and which is a text that's sort of a resignation to God's will in a situation where he doesn't want that to be a case, versus the vast majority of scripture where it does seem to be God's will to heal, and uh, that seems to be the default because it's attached to his name. 
Uh, why, yeah. why do that? Why make that your default prayer? Why not your default prayer being an expectation of God healing? That's, I think that's great. I, I think, imagine, imagine you're in this scenario and you're a pastor and uh, a, a husband and a, and a wife come in, their kids in school and they're coming in frantic. Pastor, pastor, pray for our child. What's wrong with your child? And they say, there is a gunman in their elementary school and we're afraid that he's going to shoot up the whole school and kill all of these innocent children. How awful. And the pastor goes, okay, let's pray. And then he goes, Lord, if it's your will that all these little baby children don't get horribly mutilated and murdered, like the, the parents are going, who's this Jesus you're praying to? Like, if it's his will, like you think God, like Jesus is up in heaven. Like, I can't wait for all these babies to get mowed away. Like you think about that for a second. It places the character of God in, it does harm to the person hearing the prayer. Like, we, you don't pray that way. When you know that it's God's will, that, that the innocent should not slaughter, you pray that the innocent don't get slaughtered. Like, that's a thing that you pray because you know the character of God. Now, this is an interesting question uh, by, well, none other than the American Gospel folks, who says, hey, do you think the Father's heart to heal is getting close to Jesus Christ's perfect theology? Doesn't the Father uh, also will suffering and give that as a gift, as a means to our sanctification? Now, here, here's where I would, I would ask, where would suffering be a gift? Now, granted, he will use all things to the good of those who love him, but, but the question is, is is the sickness, is the disease, is that a net good or is God making good out of evil? Does he make good out of loss? If the demonic attack on uh, Job is in fact demonic and God uh, then restores and, and, and raises up and teaches a lesson and, and, and brings glory to his name, praise be to God, but the act itself is demonic, right? So I, I think that we need to be we need to be careful when we're saying, oh, it's the Father's heart to heal. And when we say things like, uh, when people often say Jesus Christ is perfect theology, it's a way to like uh, not wrestle with theodicy. Uh, I would encourage people, you know, go check out the Habakkuk sermon I preached, you know, this Sunday uh, at Wellspring Church, or you can go to, you know, the podcast that we have uh, for Kings. It's up there too. Yes, if you if you have a sickness that's not being healed, you've prayed, you know, you've sought God, can God... Uh, in the midst of that, sanctify our hearts, certainly. Uh, but but to say, you know, Justin, like God is, you know, God wants you to be a paraplegic um, and, and he desires that for you because he's just making you more godly. Jesus, Jesus didn't have, he wasn't a paraplegic and, 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 and the father didn't need to strike him with all kinds of diseases and illnesses and sickness to make, to, to teach Jesus how to be perfect through what he suffered, right? Like e each of, yes, God can use those things. But, but again, to say that that's how he wants to teach us those things. I think we're peering into divine mysteries. Paul saw things in the heavens that, you know, lofty things that were too, that were unlawful to speak of glorious things. And he was humbled through his thorn in the flesh. Yes. If, if, uh, you know, all of us, you know, have a sickness or disease because we traveled to the third heaven, you know, maybe, oh, I shouldn't say that on here. Never mind. Um, maybe some of these people who are going to the third heaven might need a little thorn in the flesh to be humbled a little. I don't know. Um, uh, anyway, uh, and, and again, any, we're, we're all on the same page the here. Statements. Uh, I feel like we're, I made over statements. No, no, it's just, look, we're, we're all on the same page here that, that God certainly does use suffering, right? There's no doubt about it. He redeems suffering. I think the assumption that it's not God's will to heal when somebody doesn't get healed is a bad assumption because I know stories of people when they first got prayer, they didn't get healed. Uh, I could, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of, of one that I, I want to share this, but it's going to take too long to share it. I just know that later on, when they addressed a certain demonic thing that had happened to them, after that thing was kicked out, then they also got healed. And the the spread between the first prayer for healing and then them actually getting healed was about six months. And so, and I think the same thing could be true with the boy who is throwing himself into the fire. The disciples weren't able to get the boy healed. Jesus was a little bit later. But should they have all concluded, just not God's will to heal? Or, or should they have should they have been praying? Uh, well, if it be your will in that moment, why didn't the disciples pray that? Yeah, you so just see it. And Josh, can you put the question back on the screen that American Gospel asked because that'll help 
help me make sure I answer it. But uh, I think it's actually a great question. And for those who are unfamiliar with what he's talking about, Jesus perfect theology, it's a sermon that Bill Johnson, uh, Bill Johnson gave, and he was talking about God's heart for healing. And it's kind of just like, well, just look at Jesus. He healed people all the time. So that's God's heart. Excuse me. I sound German here. Ha. Uh, God's ha. heart for healing. Try not to hock a loogie on you guys. And, uh, and so if, and I think this was the same sermon, guys, you can correct me if I'm wrong, where, you know, people, Bill brings up, you know, hey, people bring up Job sometimes. And well, I tell them Job is the question. Jesus is the answer. You know, that kind of thing. And Moses, who makes man mute? That bit. Right. That's the question. Jesus is the answer. I don't like that. I think that's bad. I don't either. Do because, uh, because it's, it, it's, it's real similar to, uh, what's that guy, uh, Boyd, Greg Boyd and what he has with this cruciform hermeneutic and reinterprets the entire old Testament through the cross by kind of like undoing like the stories of God's wrath and a sign, like it, it it's a dangerous thing. It's, it's borderline. I'm not calling this, I'm not labeling bill this, but Marcionism, uh, where it, where it's kind of like, well, that old Testament, that's just kind of like a problem, but here's the answer. I think it's too simplistic and I don't think bill meant that, but I think his followers will sometimes run with it. And, uh, and so I don't like that. Now the statement, Jesus is perfect theology by itself is, a good statement. He is perfect theology. It just depends what does someone mean by that. And when Bill unpacked it, I didn't love the way he unpacked that. Uh, I think the other thing that I would say it creates a false is, dichotomy. Yeah, and, and maybe even push back on Josh a little bit. But I, maybe please you do. I overstated. I felt it. Yeah, but, <laughs> but when Josh, you were talking about, and maybe both of you guys, you you non Calvinists there, um, talking about how like God redeems suffering and so on. I, I wouldn't want to give the impression that, and I know you wouldn't say this, it's not as though God's like shocked that someone fell into suffering. It's like, oh sure. no, well, I'll make something no, good out of it. not at all. Right? So, you know, we have 2 Corinthians 1 where Paul felt in himself the sentence of death. Why? So that I might trust in him who raised the dead. So like this thing actually happened with a divine purpose. Or Philippians chapter 1, it was granted to you not only that you believe, Faith is a gift. Forgot to mention that. Anyway, not only that you believe, that you also, that you might suffer for his name. And so uh, suffering, it can be a gift. So I don't reject that articulation. And and I, I think like, hey, uh, but we can look at it like we do in the book of Job. Think about it like this. And this is where I think Job really helps us not get too simplistic uh, in our theology. Job suffers by the hand of the Chaldeans, by the hand of the Sabians who are raiding and, and pillaging and, and by the windstorm and the firestorm, which is probably lightning and, and so on. And so people die, sheep are stolen, you know, houses destroyed and all of this. And, and the devil is the one who instigated it. And so, the, and, and so at the end of it, though, Job says, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then it finishes with Job didn't sin. Job did not sin. Yeah. Right. And so the question is, wait, 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 who's at fault here? The Sabians, the Chaldeans, the tornado, the devil or God? And the answer seems to be in the book of Job yes. that, yeah, like, yes, all play a role in their different way. God permits whatever he permits, but the devil's instigating over here and he's using all kinds of earthly forces. And so in whatever way we talk about a gift, I would want to talk about it in those terms that have all the mosaic and nuance rather than God being like, here's some paralysis and uh, here's some death. And I, I mean, I, I just, it's, it's that and, and granted, even on that death, like, yes, there's, there's judgment of God and so we on. I do but believe it, he does God those things. Judgment. God does it, cause suffering. It, and I think that's what part of what makes a statement like Jesus is perfect theology a really difficult one because there's so much nuance to it. It's it's hard to have just a one liner that explains it all. Yeah, and that's where I think what, what I'm saying about will is like that decree. And, I, and and again, I could feel the oversimplification. That's why I'm like I feel like I've overstated here the the decree of God and the desire of God. And I understand that those two things, the way that they function, that His desire is for health, His desire is for wholeness, His desire. But then in the same sense, 
decrees, like like the American Gospel guy said, granted to suffer for his namesake, right? We would agree that in Acts, you are, you're counted worthy to suffer for the gospel. If you're, you're in uh, some third world country, you're in China, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're out there preaching the gospel, you get a beer thrown in your face, you're struck. Yes, you're suffering for the gospel, and it's been granted to you uh, to do so. I, I think many pastors get wounded by the hand of God so that they're better pastors in their ministry. Uh, but at the same token, um, I, I am not trying to, I, I think that there is this kind of crutch inside of a lot of people who are ill, and I don't mean to use crutch as a as a pun, but uh, that are ill, that we would say, um, this is my friend. This sickness is my friend. It's a gift from God. When every single time in the Bible, God treats sickness as an enemy, not as a friend. Yeah. And that's yeah. what I'm trying to say. Like, I, I think that it would be it would be wrong of us in the same way that we would look at uh, praying to God. You know, if it's your will, you know, would you save all these babies from, you know, this horrible shooter like that? What are you talking about? He, he wants to save the innocent. So so I think that to some extent, yes, he uses everything. Uh, yes, it's all going to sanctify us, whether we're healed or unhealed. Praise God, he'll use it. But at that same token, um, what kind of picture of God are we painting? Um, and I think that's really important. Miller, it sounded like you and I both had something to say there at the same time. Yeah, I was thinking about the Matt Chandler sermon that he gave years ago regarding um, healing. You know, he he paralleled healing to what happens with, and, and I know I'm not going to pronounce her names correctly, though I be Jewish, I'm still not really good at the Hebrew. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get thrown into a furnace. And their statement is, our God will heal us. Wow. If I were Peter's, I would go, that's just wrong. You should not assume that. You should be praying instead something like, if it be your will. But they said, our God will save us. Our God can save us. And even if our God doesn't save us, we will not bow down and worship. Yeah, um, that's faith. So I, I think, yeah, I think that's faith. It's the assumption that God will save. It's also the knowing that God can do it and the recognition that even if he doesn't, we're still going to be obedient to God. I think that's yeah. what faith looks like. And, and it feels like Justin Peters would accuse those guys of uh, presenting a false portrait of God. And I'm going, well, then the, the biblical characters are doing that and they're setting the precedent for us. Um, that's good. I don't know. Hey, yeah. And, and I think on I know the you're going to try to go ahead. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I know you're going to try to advance to the next video. I have one tiny thought, though. Oh, no, me too. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, so Sam Storms just texted me. And sorry, Justin and Jim, y'all don't have my cell phone number. But if you reach out, I could give you my cell phone number. And then we could we could continue the debate through text message. But this is what Sam said. He said, why not pray, Father, according to your will, I ask for this person. And so I think Sam's trying to make the point, like, look, this is... That we have a lot more revealed about the will of God for healing uh, through the ministry of Jesus than we do for uh, for God not wanting healing. So, uh, go ahead, Josh. What? No, yeah. Last last thought. It was off of what Miller just said about Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I'll give their Jewish names, not their their Theophoric Babylonian names. Um, they, they he will, he can even if he doesn't. Right. That is, I think, also instructive to our word of faith friends on the other side of the aisle, I would just say, hey guys, uh, notice that they did not have confidence in the outcome. They had confidence in the person. They had confidence in the person God. of God, Love that. not Amen. in the outcome of they would be saved. They trusted God no matter how it fleshed out. Um, and, and here on Remnant Radio, uh, we believe faith is trust in a person, not faith in an outcome. So when I pray for the sick, I trust in Jesus and his goodness and his will to heal, uh, and I trust him, I don't necessarily know that when I lay hands on a person, I've got psychological certainty that I've lathered myself up to believe something is going to come to pass. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next thing that, that is said in this clip that we didn't really address, he says the vast majority of charismatic preachers, I want to know where he's got that statistic. I, I feel yeah, like that's it. a gross exaggeration. I, I don't know where he found that. Um, you know, I did a quick search. Uh, he said because of TV, but it, it looks like, you know, the average you know, television viewers 65 and above. M most people don't watch TV anymore. Um, so yeah, TBN and Daystar. Okay, cool. But like those are dying industries. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't like massive YouTube channels out there of wackadoodles traveling to heaven eating mailboxes, but um, to their to the point... <laughs> to borrow a guys, Chris Roseboroughism. 
Yeah, that's right. There are there are people out there who like Mike Winger, Gavin Ortland, uh, Roos Lawn, uh, that are to the glory of God making really good Christian content. So I, I would just say, um, yeah, it's true that once upon a time the airways of Christendom were monopolized by a group of hyper charismatic dudes who monopolized all of the space. Uh, but yeah, there are guys like John MacArthur who, you know, come to the top, not because everyone's sinful, but because there's decent Bible teaching that people like. Mike Winger would be another example of that. Good Bible teaching. And you know what? The crazy thing is Mike is charismatic. It's not crazy. Okay. Um, any other thoughts on that? Or do we need to go to the next clip so that we get done with this program? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go to the next one. This clip from Jim Osman talking about the gift of healing quickly shut down by Sam Storms. Okay, God, God healed that, that girl in accordance with our prayers. I don't believe that any of us have the gift of healing or the gifts of healings. That gift we never prayed. existed at all, Jim. It's never existed. I, when I call people to come and pray for the sick, I've had people come up to me and say, Sam, I can't do that. I don't have the gift of healing. I said, don't worry about it. Nobody else does either. That gift as a permanent residential possession that enables an individual to heal anybody and everybody of every disease has never existed. It's a misunderstanding of the New Testament record. When do you guys want to unpack what Sam is explaining here? Uh, just to give context for the clip, Jim is saying, uh, we prayed for a girl in his church. She was raised up. God supernaturally, well, I don't want to say healed her. That might conflate terms. He supernaturally miracled her. And uh, she, her life was transformed. Uh, she was well. She was no longer infirmed of whatever sickness she had. And uh, and he says that's not a gift of healing, uh, because if it was a gift of healing, it could be done on command. Now, it's weird. The word is heal, but that's OK. Uh, what if you guys want to unpack the idea that the gift of healing was not on command? Go, Miller. I talked a lot. Oh, gosh. I'm like responding to chat. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> okay, first off, I, I agree with Sam. N none of us on this side, well, not none of us. There are people who believe that the gift of healing is on command in the Word of Faith movement. And I actually don't think that's the vast majority of people. Um, your, your guys, like, I think one of the biggest brands for charismaticism today is Bethel, and they wouldn't agree with that definition of healing. And so it's really hard to have a conversation when you're talking past one another and imposing a definition on healing onto charismatics. It falsely represents them. That is what we call a straw man. Um, and I love that Sam shut that down because it, it shows, hey, look, we're, we're not we're talking past each other. If that's what you're going to say, charismatics to find the gift of healing as, then we're never going to come to an understanding of one another. So I love that clip in particular. Um, I think Sam gives a pretty good defense later on and to show like this is not the definition biblically of healing. Uh, you don't find that the definition is, hey, let's heal on command. The very fact that they have to pluralize or that, that Paul pluralizes that gift in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 12, where he says gifts, plural of healings, which is the only gift in that list of nine gifts right there in that section that is pluralized. Why pluralize it? There's got to be some sort of implication by that. Um, and I would say that the implication is, is that one person may commonly see cancer healed. Another person may see feet get healed, like flat feet in particular. Um, but that doesn't mean that that person sees it every single time they pray. I don't know anybody who claims to have a gift. At least I don't personally know anybody who claims to have a gift, says that they can do it on demand, that it's up to them to do that. Now, there are people out there that say that, but the vast majority of charismatics that I know of don't. And so... Uh, yeah, again, it's going to be talking past each other until they come to the same definitions. Yeah, I mean, and here's what's interesting. Again, American Gospel guys, I don't know why this doesn't seem to make any logical sense to me. You have to believe healing is on command if you believe it's always God's will to heal, and therefore the lack is on our end. Well, we do believe it's God's will that all to be saved. Therefore, why aren't the evangelist seeing people saved every single time they open their mouth if the gift of evangelism is on command, right? Like, how, how does that how does that even work? That doesn't even make sense. Um, I, I would just say that for a, uh, we believe that it's God's will to save all men and not all men are saved. We believe it's God's will to heal all men. And in the age to come, all men will be healed in the same way that all men will be saved. Um, I think that you're, you're taking a hyper literal interpretation. We just explained the two wills of God 10 seconds ago. Um, and, and, and then again, this is, this is where it's happening is you're, you're taking your definition and thrusting it upon us. You're not using our categories. Um, yeah. So I, I, it would be the equivalent of me saying, well, you know, 
Uh, the cessationists don't believe in the Holy Spirit. They don't believe God leads his people, right? Like no, no cessationist believes that. But but I can create a character of cessationists and and kind of malign them in that way. But that's not fair nor true. Um, or, you know, cessationists don't believe that God moves today. But that's not the case at all. In fact, we know that Jim and uh, Justin both tell stories of supernatural healings that have happened in their lives. So that's I, th I think it's a, it's a gross over exaggeration. I don't think it's true. Um, I think the gift of healing uh, as it relates to Paul I believe Paul believed it was God's will to heal because Jesus healed everyone. His name is Rafa. Again, for all the reasons I believe that it's God's will to heal, I believe it's it's clear in Scripture. The Apostle Paul couldn't heal on command, right? Even Jesus in his own hometown, right, uh, couldn't heal many there, right, uh, except for heal a few sick people is what the text says. Um, Trophimus and Miletus sick, Epaphroditus on his deathbed before God raised him up. Uh, 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 Timothy had to take some wine for his stomach over and over in the New Testament. Paul's close accompanying companions get sick uh, and he get, isn't able to heal on command. So I, I just, I think it's a gross of over exaggeration. I think it's hard to <laughs> want to have charitable conversations where, you know, other people's categories are forced upon you. Uh, but, you know, I digress. Around you, do you have any thoughts you want to add to that? No, man, we're good. Let's get through the last clip because we're already at the hour mark. Sweet. I would nuance my assumption that it's God's general revealed will that we be healthy. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that is true. Well, I, understand. I, I think that it is true to say that God's, that health is something that, yes, God would desire, um, and it would be true in a condition if we didn't live in a sin cursed fallen world, but I would reject the premise that it's always God's will to heal. Yeah, I understand that, that. that removes some of the mystery for me. Okay, so Got I, I don't have as much mystery in that because then I look at God and I say, I know he's able to do this, but I also know that God has, by his good providence, brought far more good out of Justin's disability than, than would have happened if Justin were able-bodied. How do I know that? Because Justin is disabled, and therefore God is working out a perfect, and his perfect and holy providential plan for Justin through that disability, so there's no mystery to me in that. So, I don't believe it's God's will for Justin to be healed, otherwise God would answer the prayer of his saints regarding Justin's healing and raise him up. He hasn't. It's not God's will. Yeah, that's... Man, that's a that's an oversimplification, I think, because he hasn't answered the prayer. Therefore, it's not God's will. Like, again, you've got examples of this. He didn't answer the prayer of the apostles when they tried to cast out or they tried to heal the boy who was throwing himself into the fire. Um, there are times when it doesn't get answered the first time you pray. Right. That's but okay. Then it, but then it was answered subsequently. It, right. Yeah. I mean, lots of stories about persevering prayer uh, that you know, or James chapter four. Uh, you have not, and you ask not, or you receive not because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Like he's creating a category of prayers, uh, of, of unanswered prayers that, you know, actually take that example back. That's not going where, <laughs> where I was intending here. Uh, I'm actually going to quote total subject change. Uh, third John one, two, it says, beloved, I pray that in all respects, you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. I wonder, is that, uh, cause this is written to the elder, uh, the elder to the beloved Gaia, Gaius, whom I love in truth. So is, does he only wish that Gaius was in good health? Is that for everybody? Uh, just as your soul prospers, I, I think that you can make a pretty convincing case, and I think we have today that God's uh, that God's heart is for healing. Uh, his His desire is for that. Um, there, there's a, a verse in Lamentations three that comes to mind when all the suffering that Jeremiah and Israel are going through, and he's lamenting, 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 and uh, and the verse says he afflicts us, but not from his heart, and um, and so. The affliction served a purpose and it was the judgment of God on Israel. And, and so there can be that like whole redemptive purpose of suffering, but like that deep down desire is really is the picture or the portrait is painted in Eden. That's God's desire is perfect peace and harmony. And then Jesus comes in and he shows us through his healing ministry, that desire more. And then in Matthew 8, 16 to 17, it says that Jesus came and beginning with his earthly life and culminating in his death, because he quotes an atonement verse in Isaiah 53, Jesus paid for our sicknesses, bore our infirmities on the cross. You see more of God's heart there. And then, of course, in the final resurrection, when we're all made perfectly whole, you, 
there's so much to see God's heart for healing. So I just, I still don't buy it that it's like God just wants, uh, I, I would just rather nuance it and just say, let's use the two wills of God to talk about it instead of speaking past each other. That's good. That's good. Guys, uh, I think this is a good place to wrap the show. I would encourage you to go watch the whole um, four hour uh, video. I'll tell you what, I think that the charismatics did a decent job uh, defending our beliefs. Uh, I'll tell you, I kind of wish that the she was placed on the other foot. I I'm kind of I'm kind of tired, going to voice this out publicly, of, of charismatics being drilled to explain what prophecy is and healing is and those kinds of things. I'd like it to be put on the other foot. I'd like the cessationist to have to explain to the charismatic when the gifts of actually ended like give me a bible verse that says that they ended and, and it I, I see so many criticisms and of when. the charismatics saying oh okay, you, well, you're you're doing prophecy wrong you're doing healing wrong you're doing tongues wrong it's like yeah but you're doing everything wrong because you're not doing anything um at least i'm pursuing these things as i'm commanded to in scripture but they say oh no those things ceased it's like yeah you're, that that premise question i'd love for you to answer that and i really wish there was a four-hour video drilling into that issue. So I, I think uh, our guys did a decent job. You know, Sam calls them out on the signs of an apostle, about the the, the, the dative case and the nominative case uh, in and Second Corinthians. He does a great job. There's no response. Which proves there. the opposite. Yeah, there's there's no pushback from the cessationists answering that question. Um, that's never God's will to heal. <clears throat> or sorry, uh, that was never the, the way that that gift operated. There was no pushback on that. There were statements that were made. The cessations didn't really respond to, didn't really engage with. So I feel like we've got the better part of the interchange towards that last third of this section. Uh, I will tell you the first two thirds of the section, I think the cessationists probably did a better job. Um, I'm not throwing any shade at Sam or um, Well, the first two I, thirds had nothing to do with scripture. Most of it had to do with uh, our ad hominem arguments about certain public figures. That's how you categorize it was like, a false teacher. Yeah, yeah, it, was all it had nothing to do with the cessation teacher. or continuation of the gifts. It was yeah. it was ad hominem about certain figures, and the guys were going, "Yeah, we think some problems. There's some problems that exist with these figures." It, it yeah, wasn't and that, actually a debate about cessationism versus continuationism. That is something we need to talk a lot more about because um, I'll be honest, guys. I I think that there needs to be some reassessment, reevaluation of those sorts of things because we have gotten ourselves in a giant mess in the charismatic space. Um, because of false teaching and because of things that we've put up with, cultures that, hey, let's keep things silent, let's let's not talk about things, let's keep them under the rug. Um, I, I think I think we've we've created some problems that we have to address. And and I think, I don't know, I I'll be honest, I agree with everything that Sam and Brown said as far as it is we judge fruit and doctrine. We don't speculate about things that are going on behind closed doors. Um, but I'll tell you, man, I, I feel ever so tempted to go the way of the cessationist on this one and just being like, dude, looks like a duck quacks like a duck. Let's bring hellfire. Let's, burn. Let's call everybody a false teacher and a false prophet. I'll tell you, because it, it feels like the right response when all of all of the charismatic uh, heroes are biting the dust. So we've got to we've got to reassess. We've got to retalk through a lot of that. And I'm looking forward to uh, when we kind of do some of that, that other stuff in our next video. Yeah, next week we'll talk about it. But I think it's it's a good discussion. When do you call someone a false teacher and so on? So um, I I found myself agreeing with Storms and Brown more. But yeah, let's uh, let's talk about that next week. So guys, next week we will be talking, uh, reviewing again. It's a four hour uh, a four hour episode that we're reviewing. So we're gonna go more toward the first part, which is about identifying false teachers and will you call Benny Hinn a false teacher and when you we call Kenneth Copeland a false teacher and we call this person and that person and why not and what is a false teacher and how are you using the word and how am I using it and how does Paul use it and so on and so uh anyway it's going to be a rich discussion encourage you guys to join us next week uh make sure you hit that like and subscribe button as you watch this video maybe share it around and also check out our newsletter uh our newsletter has all kinds of has some insider information as well as just kind of all things remnant radio helps you stay in touch with what we have going on. So, uh, so make sure it irresistibly you draws you, subscribe. it irresistibly draws. I said it irresistibly draws you into more of remnant radio. That's what it does. It does. It is the only way the drawing can happen. So it is irresistible, uh, guys make sure, uh, yeah, do all those things and we will see you next week. Have a great week. See you Monday. And, uh, what's our show on Monday, Josh, I'm trying to remember. It is this book right here by Ben Witherington the mm, Third, Jesus the Seer. Whoa.
It's okay. Be, He's it's been fun. on before. He talked about Arminianism a while ago. Anyway. Okay, guys. Have a great day.